Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Portland, the Old Cobblestone Church. We're delighted you're here for this presentation tonight. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that after the presentation, we'll be having a reception down these stairs to my left and your right. Um, and once again, thank you everyone for coming. Tabitha? Hello everyone. I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Diane Ames. She's a longtime uh, Portland County Historical Society board member and former president of CCHS. She's had an interest in the Underground Railroad for many years. She developed this talk many years ago, <laughs> but I've never heard it, so I was anxious to hear this talk. There was interest in this topic on Facebook, so I approached the Cobblestone Church of Unitarian Universalist Church about doing a collaborative project, and they were open to it, so here we are, and we're glad to have you here. We are having a free will uh, offering for the Cobblestone Church. There's a container up here, and as you go down to the reception area, you can put something in there. Without further ado, here's Diane. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so much. I'm surprised to see so many people here. I figured there'd be 15 or 20. I didn't know we'd have a, almost a sellout crowd. How many of you have heard me give this talk before? One? Oh, good. <laughs> Two? <laughs> All right, so, so there'll be some new information for you. This talk has been around quite a, a long time. First of all, I want you to look around. We are in the oldest public building, we believe, in Cortland. So, and this does have ties to the uh, abolitionist movement and the Underground Railroad, so we're really glad to be here. The next thing I want to tell you is how I got involved in this. Now, just a few minutes ago, I was talking with Nevea, is that right, Nevea, and her brother, Tyler, and Nevea said, oh, I'm so excited to learn about the Underground Railroad. Well, when I was in fifth grade in Maine, New York, Ethel Avery was my fifth grade teacher. I'm suspecting that some of you remember Emerson Avery and Emerson Avery Jr. Well, she was their mother and grandmother, and she was my fifth grade teacher. Now, just north of Maine, New York, on the road to Nanticoke, there was a house, the Gonzales House, that we were always told had ties to the Underground Railroad, and that there was a secret panel and all sorts of things. And of course, in fifth grade, I'm thinking, now how did they get those rails under the ground. <laughs> well, Mrs. Avery pretty quickly set me straight. So, this is a paper I wrote in 1994 for the Ladies Literary Club. Uh, we were studying the black experience, and I thought, aha, now's my chance to study up on this topic. So, I'll do some reading, I'll s swap off on some ideas, and here we go. Do you have any idea what years the Underground Railroad operated? 18, six, 1830 to about 1860, around the time of the Civil War. Many men and women of African descent escaped the bondage of slavery by means of a rather unconventional railroad. Extending both north and south, this unique railroad boasted many of the same characteristics of a regular railroad. The passengers were fugitive slaves. The agents, or station masters, helped the passengers in their quest for freedom. The depot, or the station, was a secret place where food and necessities were supplied for the ongoing escape, and engineers and conductors actually transported the slaves from one station to another. There were no rails of steel, but instead a network of paths through fields, woods, following rivers and streams, using any means of transportation available, boats, trains, and wagons, or even walking, often following the North Star. Eating houses and hotels were open night and day to provide the best possible food for the travelers. Of necessity, the secrecy surrounding the operations of this railroad caused many facts to be lost, but word of mouth and conscientious historians have saved some very interesting facts. Estimates of the number of passengers that rode on this railroad vary from 30,000 to as high as 100,000, but we will probably never know. Now why 
did we have, why did the Underground Railroad come into existence? Why did we have slavery? Well, slavery enabled the southern farmers to turn previously unproductive and cheap land into prosperous plantations growing cotton, sugar, indigo, and rice. The Negroes from the hot African continent proved to be well suited to working in the climate of the south. And I'm going to re refer to them as Negroes. I looked this up because we're never quite sure what is the correct term to use. But a Negro is a member of a rare human, a race of humankind native to Africa and classified under physical, according to physical features. So that's the term that I will use throughout this paper. In the north, the climate was colder and the need for more skilled industrial workers made slavery impractical. Thus, the seeds for controversy were planted. Now there were, uh, we, New York was one of the early states to celebrate the abolition of slavery, July 4th, 1827. All Negroes have been set free by an act passed in the United States in 1817. All states bordering on the rivers and lakes between the United States and Canada were free states. However, the U.S. Constitution still allowed rewards to be offered for the return of runaway slaves, and many found bounty hunting to be a very lucrative means of support. It was not uncommon for slave owners to offer $300 or more for the return of an escaped slave. Throughout this paper, I will refer to a man named Eber Pettit. In 1879, he wrote an account of the Underground Railroad in western New York, and there are many similarities. Eber Pettit tells about Henry, a 28-year-old literate blacksmith who had earned his freedom by paying his master $30 each month. The master died before Henry received his papers, and the slave owner's heirs refused to honor Henry's claim. They seized him, sent him to the New Orleans market, where such mechanics as he would sell for from $3,000 to $5,000. Well, Henry did have a happy ending. He eventually escaped on a ship bound for Baltimore, and he was aided by conductors on the Underground Railroad to make it safely to Canada. Now, there were two fugitive slave laws that affected the United States, the 1793 law and the 1850 law. The 1793 law meant a $5,000 fine for harboring escaped slaves or preventing their arrest. The 1850 fugitive slave law promised two penalties, a $1,000 fine on any person aiding an escaped slave or imprisonment not exceeding six months plus $1,000 for every slave lost. Okay, now we're in Cortland. The date is April 25, 1837, and the Anti-Slavery Society of Cortland was formed. Garrett Smith, who was a well-known Central New York abolitionist, had given an inspiring lecture. The object of this 78-member society was, and I quote, to aid in the great work of enfranchising the enslaved in the United States and to improve and elevate the character and condition of free people of color. Most people in Cortland at the time, I'm told, were against slavery, but the majority felt that discussing the problem would only lead to trouble. Now there's a paper at the Historical Society written in 1953 about the Underground Railroad by Miss Alma Blanchard. She tells us that there were five main lines that ran through New York State. Three went through Buffalo, and the other two went through Albany and Syracuse. One of the latter routes, the one from Syracuse, ran from Binghamton through Cortland County to the north. It's believed that there were three spurs to the Underground Railroad in this part of the country. One went from Harford to Virgil or Freeville, one from Blodgett Mills to either McGraw or Truxton, and then on to Peterborough, and one to Pratt Corners toward Little York. There was also another siding over in Cincinnati. So we're ready for the first picture. There it is. In Harford, Philip Norwood, born in November of 1809, was a Virginia pioneer. His father was a Virginia pioneer. Philip and his wife opened their home as a station on the Underground Railroad for most of their lives. 
Philip was a millwright whose specialty was cutting lumber. He'd been an active Christian but left his church when the minister stated that slavery was in accordance with the church principles. On an account by Mrs. Blanchard, Miss Blanchard, they described the occasion when a group of fugitives arrived at the Norwood farm. After feeding the runaways, Norwood arranged temporary beds around the kitchen fire as there were too many for the beds in the house. Just before dawn, Norwood's dogs commenced to bark alerting the slaves to possible danger. The story goes that Norwood calmed the fugitives by taking his trusted rifle and saying, you lie down and sleep. No man shall cross that threshold after you alive. The next day, Norwood transported the company of slaves 25 miles through a blinding snowstorm, probably to the Kravath home in Little York, which you'll see in, later in this program. According to Miss Blanchard's paper, this story is supposedly told true. It has been told from one generation to the next among various families in Cortland County. And for years, the Cortland County Historical Society was in possession of at least one part of Norwood's wagon. A letter in 1935 from J. Hammond to Mrs. Krutz at the Historical Society described a light lumber or farm wagon that is approximately 120 years old Norwood used this wagon to haul slaves from his farm to a farm near Little York. Okay. The next picture is also, oh, there we, yeah, this is the, the farm in Hartford, the Norwood farm. Okay, going on now to Virgil. The spring 1992 letter from the Virgil Historical Society tells about the underground stop in Virgil. Nathan Boughton was a staunch citizen and abolitionist. In 1920, his son, Edmund Boughton, wrote a letter, which is now housed at the Virgil Historical Society, recounting the station. The stations on the Underground Railroad were about 18 miles apart. The first station south of Virgil was at Richford and was kept by Mrs. Boughton's brother-in-law, William Gee. Coming north, the slaves in wagon, wagons, sometimes covered with hay, passed through South Hartford, North Hartford, and onto the Boughton House. Travel was usually under cover of darkness. In 1979, the Virgil Historical Society met at this, at this farm, at that time owned by Malin Perkins. Mr. Perkins showed them a trap door in the kitchen floor, which was used to get to a passageway and onto the barn. This trap door has since been removed. A 1993 video made by the Homer Junior High class shows what is believed to be an opening to a tunnel which ended in the nearby woods. The opening has since been filled in with concrete. Next picture. Okay, who recognizes this? No? Closer to home than that. It's the Methodist Church, yes. This is the Methodist Church that stood just down the street, on Church Street, okay? For reasons of secrecy, fugitive slaves avoided more heavily populated areas. But there are some recollections that Cortland and Homer were not without safe havens. The corner of Port Watson Street, near Church Street, is reported to have been a stop on the Underground Railroad. Okay, next slide. An escape tunnel is said to have run diagonally toward what is, was where the Methodist Church stood. Okay. Here we are. A little farther to the north stands what was then known as the Universalist Church. An undated article at the Historical Society is headlined, Aided Slaves. And I quote, in the days of the Underground Railroad, when slaves were being brought out of the South, the women of this church helped in the needs of the underground station. They prepared bandages and provided food and warm clothing when these were needed to aid slaves in their escape. Okay, so now we're in the middle of the 19th century, and at this church there was a series of lectures known as the Lyceum Circuit, probably uh, named after the uh, garden at Athens where Aristotle taught philosophy, the Lyceum. Then, this was known as the Universalist Church, as I said, as the merger of the Universalist Church and the Unitarian Church had not yet occurred. 
William H. Fish was the, was the minister of the church at that time. And whatever you want to grant Mr. Fish, he was an extraordinary man when it came to planning events, events which would bring people to his church. And so he jumped in with the whole Lyceum Circuit crowd to invite people to his church. And he was so smart that he always demanded that they come and speak on a Saturday night. Now, imagine yourself 150 years ago in a church in Cortland on Saturday night. You've traveled from Ithaca to be there. You were obviously not going home that night, so you stayed over to go to church on Sunday morning. And Mr. Fish filled this church Sunday after Sunday because he always asked whoever spoke to his church on Saturday night to speak again on Sunday night for free, or Sunday morning for free. Some very famous people spoke here. I, I was amazed at the list. Ralph Waldo Emerson, William Lloyd Garrison, Susan B. Anthony, Clara Barton, Wendell Phillips, Henry Ward Beecher, and George Custis. And I assume they spoke in this church, in this very room. And the lectures, I understand, drew crowds that often went to Merrill's tra Tavern afterwards for more discussion. I don't know where Merrill's Tavern was. I've got to research that. But now I want to tell you about one of the speakers that I didn't mention. Okay, next. Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet was an American abolitionist and author. She was the seventh of 13 children born to a Calvinist preacher, Lyman Beecher, and his very religious wife, Roxanna Foote Beecher. At the age of 21, Harriet moved to Cincinnati to join her father, who was president of the Lane Theological Seminary. By that time, her mother had died. She joined a literary club there and met Calvin Ellis Stowe, a widower who was a professor at the seminary. The two were married and became ardent critics of the slavery and the supporters and became supporters of the Underground Railroad. Now, I bet someone here can tell me what book Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote. Uncle Tom's Cabin. Okay. In 1852, her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was published. In less than a year, an unprecedented 300,000 copies had been sold. And her publisher, John Jewett, then issued an inexpensive version, which sold for 37 and a half cents. I'm comparing that to a hardcover book that is published these days, and then, you know, when that runs out, then all of a sudden we can buy it uh, in paperback or online. Well, three of the characters in Uncle Tom's Cabin were based on students at the New York Central College in McGraw. After the Civil War, Harriet Beecher Stowe traveled to the capital of Washington, D.C., where she met President Abraham Lincoln on November 25, 1862. Stowe's daughter, Hattie, reported, and I quote, it was a very droll time that we had at the White House, I assure you. I will only say now that it was all very funny, and we were ready to explode with laughter all the while. Well, what Lincoln said is a minor mystery. Um, her son, Harriet's son, later reported that Lincoln greeted her by saying, so you were the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. Her own accounts are vague, but including the letter reporting a meeting to her husband where she says, I had a real funny interview with the president. Well, now on to our family's Cortland connection with Harriet Beecher Stowe. My wonderful mother-in-law, Elizabeth Scotty Ames. <coughs> this is her picture. Mm -hmm. Catch it when you go down for cookies. <laughs> Scotty was a doll collector and an author. And in 1992, she had a, an article published in Doll News, which is a national publication for doll collectors, entitled, My Beecher Baby Search. So now I'm gonna tell you the co connection to Harriet Beecher Stowe. So I'm reading from Scotty's article here. This was written in 1992. 
A decade ago, I was attending an auction of antique dolls, and a noted doll collector had bid on a Beecher baby doll. We can get the next picture. There we go. <laughs> and as our young lady down here said, ooh, that's kind of spooky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll show you our Beecher baby in a minute. At that time, I was not particularly impressed with this cloth doll, whose face was scarred with fabric runs. In fact, she looked as if she had a bad case of acne. <laughs> the successful bidder said the doll did not have embroidered eyes, and she did not want her. The auctioneer put the doll back on the auction, and I, remember this is Scotty speaking, bought her for much less than the original bidder had paid for her. In all the years that followed, and all the Beecher dolls that I have had the privilege to inspect, I've never yet found one with embroidered eyes. The years passed, and until recently, I never paid much attention to my rag doll, the so-called Beecher babe. Because we live fairly close to Elmira, New York, the original home of this doll, I decided it would be exciting to research this doll and write her story. Well, the creator of the doll was Julia Jones Beecher. Julia Jones was the daughter of Eliza Steele Webster and therefore the granddaughter of Noah Webster. What did Noah Webster do? The dictionary. Father of American scholarship and education and the Webster Merriam Dictionary, the Webster Dictionary. Now, Julia's brother was, her husband was a brother of Henry Ward Beecher and Harriet Beecher Stowe. And although Julia did not become as famous as her, or as well known as her famous relatives, she will always enjoy a special position of honor in the doll world. Mrs. Beecher was a beautiful young woman in 1857 when she became the second wife of Reverend Thomas K. Beecher, and as a bride came to Elmira to share with her husband the ministry of Park Church. Julia Beecher was talented and artistic. She was an accomplished sculptor and did a marvelous bust of her husband, which can be seen in the glass case entryway of the church. Although Mrs. Beecher was childless, she loved children, and she created the now famous rag doll for one of her nieces. In a history of the Park Church in Elmira, the following is written about the Sewing Society and the Missionary Society for whose benefit the Beecher dolls were made. And I quote, the early gatherings of Sewing Society were held on Friday afternoon at the homes of, homes of members. The hostess prepared a simple supper for all the workers to which the husbands and fathers were invited. The first missionary society was formed because of the interest of Mrs. Beecher and because the treasury was so empty. The women sought for ways to change this condition. The making of the Beecher babes was the result. In 1893, Mrs. Beecher started making the dolls out of Lyle stockings. Who can tell me what Lyle is? Anybody know? Well, years ago, you used to wear Lyle stockings. I think they were quite heavy. They were made out of fine cotton thread, and it was used mainly for stockings. So the women in the sewing circle were so entranced with the doll that they asked Julia if she would make dolls for their children. The very first doll was given to the Beecher's young niece, Daisy Day. But not too long after this doll was made, the Sewing Circle women started a project of making these dolls and selling them to raise money to help the poor of the congregation. The project was so successful that the treasury of the Sewing Circle was no longer a starveling as it once was described. One report said that it took all day for the horse and buggy to deliver the baskets filled with articles that this doll fund had made possible. Some of the proceeds from the doll sales were used for missionary work, which explains why the doll is called a missionary rag baby. I'm gonna show you, and there's another picture. This is another uh, sample of the, of the Beecher babe. The Beecher dolls, um, I'm sorry, wait a minute. The, uh, in, in the woman's edition of the Elmira Advertiser of April 13th in 1895, we jumped ahead a few years, Mrs. Beecher told a reporter that after the expenses of $898.49 had been deducted, 
the large sum of $1,111.89 had been distributed between foreign and home missions from the Beecher Doll sales. These records were kept for the first 10 years. The Beecher Dolls are made as a life-size baby and are 21 inches tall, a few are smaller, and all are alike except a few are, next slide, colored babies. The body is stuffed and the toes and fingers are stitched, much like modern soft sculpture dolls. The legs are stitched to bend and the body has a belly button. The dolls are almost always dressed as babies. In the beginning, the nose was made of stuffing and stitched to shape. The ears were made the same way. This is our Beecher baby, and she is, you'll get to see her close up when you come up this direction. And, yep, she does have legs. I don't I haven't checked to see if she has a belly button. I'm not sure I can get this. I don't know that I can get to it or not, but we'll check later. I took part of the baby. Thank you, part of the baby. Yeah, this was, this was, this was Bud's mother's. Okay. And um, Bud's mother had quite an extensive collection of dolls, and um, after she passed away, we chose a few, and our children and nieces and nephews all got to choose, and then they were sent to a, an auction house. And um, so somebody else is loving them now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we're back to 1859, the Cobblestone Church, and the Lyceum Lecture Series. I'll kind of go to the next side. Now, this is not the church that I'm going to be speaking of. This church, the this well, what is this church? You recognize it? It's, right, it's the Presbyterian Church, right down the street. And so the next story has to do with this church. Um, the story that I'm going to tell you took place in the building previous to this building. This building was built in 1890. Um, but the story I'm going to tell you took place in 1859. But this will just get you on the right part of Church Street. Okay. 1859, we're back at the Cobblestone Church and the Lyceum Lecture Series. And Ralph Waldo Emerson has come here to speak. He will be paid the princely sum of $30. Now, in the audience that Saturday evening, there was one man named Stephen Brewer, a harness maker by trade, who had moved to Cortland several years before. He was also a justice of the peace, claims agent, and the year that Emerson was there, he was also a county judge. Among other things, he was an elder in the Presbyterian Church of Cortland, where he was a regular attendee, a member for 18 years, and a Sunday school teacher. Now, one should understand that the Cortland Presbyterian Church was at that time something of an establishment church. It might have been the richest church in the community. It was very conservative, and perhaps most of all, it was pro-slavery. The Universalist Church, on the other hand, was probably middle class at best. You notice I'm saying Universalist again because they, they were not the Unitarian Church, nor the Unitarian Universalist Church. They had not merged at that time. Now, the Universalist Church was liberal, and the Universalist Church, abolitionist. That evening, as several other evenings before, Mr. Stephen Brewer had visited the Universal Church, Universalist Church, also called the Stone Church, and there he listened to lectures that came on this Lyceum circuit. And apparently, the minister of the Presbyterian Church had confronted him some weeks before and suggested he not do that. And apparently, Mr. Brewer told the ministers that it was not the minister's place to tell him what to do about going to the Universalist Church and hearing lectures. But after the Emerson lecture, this was a little too much. All right to stand for some of these people, but when Emerson came through, they had other ideas. So a committee of elders approached this man, who was also an elder of the Presbyterian Church, and told him that he should attend no more lectures at the Universalist Church. Mr. Brewer said to these men, brethren, let's not ask too much. Now that was a stunningly brilliant statement. 
I don't know whether Mr. Brewer knew that he was about to be headed for trial, but by saying, brethren, you ask too much, he was. He then set himself up to be in that trial. Differing from saying, it's none of your business what I do, because they would have found him guilty immediately and thrown him out, he said, it's not your place to do this. He didn't say, no, I will not do it. He simply said, brethren, you ask too much. Saying it in a way that's all right if you ask about some things. It's all right if you let me do certain things. But this is a line you go too far in your authority. So when it came time for the trial, Mr. Brewer was really prepared. He had simply said that the brethren overstated what they wanted him to do. But nevertheless, he was tried in the church for heresy and convicted of breaking the covenant. He was also tried for desecration of the Sabbath. But when they got to working on that and realized what, he was, what they were saying, I think the elders decided they didn't want to push that one too far because they said, you have gone to the Universalist Church rather than coming to the Presbyterian Church. And Mr. Brewer's counsel came right back and said, well, suppose he had stayed home or suppose he had gone out for a walk in the woods. Are we to try everyone for breaking the Sabbath who do not go to the Presbyterian Church? All these members who do not come to us on Sunday morning? So they wisely decided not to push that one too far and they slipped away from it. But he was finally tried and convicted for breaking the covenant. Along with him, Miles Goodyear and J.C. Carmichael were also tried and convicted. And I did find one source that said they were excommunicated temporarily. But I haven't been able to find out how long it took for them to bring them, to allow him uh, back at the church. Okay, next slide. We're down in Blodgett Mills. In 1976, the Cortland Standard ran an article with a picture of then reporter Skip Chapman inspecting a hidden room uncovered at the room of Mrs. Jenny Brown in Blodgett Mills. The home was built in 1854 and William Tisdale is credited with being the station master. In 1994, this home was occupied by Robin and Dale Quayle, and they shared this story. In the basement, there is an area of unmortared rocks, behind which is believed to be the entrance to a tunnel. Stories passed along tell that there were three tunnels exiting the house, one toward the now Old Grange building, one toward the park, and one toward the river, which runs along Route 11. Now from there, we go on to Blodgett's Mills, as it was called, Blodgett's Mills then, as it was called, and runaways might have traveled to McGaw and been safely hidden at the Israel Palmer House. There's more documentation to suggest the authenticity of this station. The home was once owned by Mrs. Esther Widger, and it's located at 21 Academy Street, diagonally across from what were the grounds of the New York Central College, which existed from 1848 to 1860. At that time, the home was referred to as the farmhouse. Information obtained from the McGraw Historical Society says, the old house on Academy Street has hand-hewn beams, and residents say that the building was constructed when the old Central College was erected. It was one of three buildings on college grounds. By working on the farm, students could earn their tuition. One of the most interesting stories recounted by lifelong resident Herman Doran recalled as a child walking through a tunnel which exited that house and ran to Smith Creek, also known as Mosquito Creek. Mr. Doran described a section of the cellar wall which was built on a frame and could be pushed in to reveal a secret door. The stones had been left in a natural, jagged way to conceal the opening. Mr. Doran then described that he could go down five steps before reaching the opening of the tunnel, which he described as being built of dry masonry and lined with heavy, large stones. Mr. Doran said, you had to bend over to walk through it and it was only about two feet wide, just about large enough to let a man through. Mr. Duran recalled that the tunnel was used as a hiding place when pursuit was really hot. The tunnel ran about 1,700 feet from the cellar to the bank of the creek. 
When the WPA workers repropped the creek banks, the exit was closed. The cellar has been pointed up with, scent, with cement in the spot which Mr. Duran described. He also told me about a spot up the valley about four miles where there was a huge hollowed out elm tree near what was then the number nine Solon Rural School where several slaves could be hid. The tree stood on, a pro on property owned by Mr. Israel Putnam who was a staunch <coughs> copperhead and Mr. Palmer's brother. It was recorded that Mr. Palmer would travel to the woodlot several times a day to cut cordwood. Fairly profitable business in that day. He would supply the fugitives with blankets and food and as soon as could be arranged, a man from Truxton would transfer the slaves to Peterborough where an associate of Garrett Smith named Peter Miller would take them on to Carthage. Records from the McGraw Historical Society state that a few slaves had settled in the area. Whenever a sheriff or marshal would inquire about them, the residents would defend them, saying that they'd been there as long as anyone, and they were descendants of Revolutionary War soldiers. Okay. Fugitives traveling north from Blodgett's Mill Station might also have gone to the Cooper Farm, or the Cowan Farm, which is located on what we now call Route 13. There are two properties there, which according to stories passed down through the years, have connections to the Underground Railroad. Now in 1994, this was the home of Mr. and Mrs. Fred Wilson and Wilson's Antiques. Mrs. Carlton Nye, who had lived in the house before the Wilsons, recalled that her father-in-law, Roland Nye, in about 1954, filled in a tunnel which went from the southwest front corner of the house and under the road. An interesting situation still existed in 1994, which does substantiate the tunnel. In the front of the cellar, there appears to be an area where the wall has been filled in with newer mortar. I'm sorry, this is the door. I've got to straighten this out here. Since there was no, the room in which this closing exists is shut off by a, an old door with a lock on the inside. Since there's no other means of egress from this room, one might surmise that the inside locks were for the protection of someone inside this area. Okay, now the next, and here's an, another picture. You can see, I think you can see the lock on the inside of the door. Note the brick. Brick wasn't particularly common. Stone was used a lot, but the, the fact that there is brick there points to the fact that there was a brickyard on the farm nearby, which is now known as the Cowan Farm. This also was verified by an 1876 map. The fact that a brickyard existed might explain the use of brick in both the floor and the wall of the cellar. Most of the floors were just dirt at that time. Okay, next slide. Then this shows the uh, front of the cellar, the area where the wall appears to have been filled in with mortar. So they thought that that was probably where the tunnel had gone from. Now across the street from this property stands another home purported to have been on the Underground Railroad. Mr. and Mrs. Elmer Stoughton lived in this house for 42 years and Mrs. Stoughton recalled that the previous owner, a Mrs. Fred Vince Coik, showed her a newspaper clipping which described this house and the Salisbury Pratt Farm on the corner of Colebrook Road as being stations on the Underground Railroad. This one was referred to as the Cooper Farm and described in a history of the Cooper Brothers Foundry as being located on the corner of Galusha Hill Road. The property ran east to the branch of the Teofnioga River. Fugitives from the south also found shelter and support in Cincinnatus. This house burned several years ago, but in 1994, this house stood on the, what I call the back road from Cincinnati to Pitcher. It was known as the old Deacon Lee House homestead. And according to Rachel McRae, the town's historian at the time, the house was turned on its foundation in 1919. In the process of moving the structure, a small cellar-like room was found, which is believed to have been accessed <coughs> by a hidden hatchway under a bed. 
Okay, now we're in Homer. How many of you remember Anna Hilton? <laughs> well, of course, I had to ask Anna about Homer and the Underground Railroad. She said, ridiculous, simply not true. It was just the way she said it. <laughs> These are her words. Anna recalls that as a child, she loved to play in the cellar of her grandmother's home, known as Brayside, and this is not Brayside. Her grandmother's home, I believe, stood behind that. The floor was dirt, and as was the case in most homes of the era, large flat stones, similar to cemetery stone, were laid on the floor. Probably to discourage Anna from wanting to play in the dirt, she was told that an escaped slave was buried down there. Anna also felt strongly that the rumors about tunnels from this house, this is the Jedediah Barber House at 18 North Main Street, to his son-in-law's home at 5 Clinton Street, and to the Temperance Tavern, which at one time stood behind the Barber House, are just that, unfounded rumor. Mr. Robert Nichols, who lived in the, in the Barber House at the time, told me that the house was built, that's the previous one, in 1825 and underwent, underwent major renovations in the 1850s. When Mr. and Mrs. Nichols renovated the home about 1969 to 1970, they found a ladder which went from the cellar to the attic behind the curved stairway. Mrs. Hilton said, well, there were children in the home who probably used the ladder. However, other people thought, well, maybe, Maybe it was part of the Underground Railroad. The only other reference to any uh, activity of the Underground Railroad in Homer is about the Kellogg House, and I haven't been, ever been able to find much more about this. The Kellogg House in Homer, I'm quoting, was an alternate station in case of an emergency at the Palmer House in McGraw. Okay. There is documentation regarding the next stop on the Underground Railroad. In 1932, the State Education Department erected a sign at the Salisbury Pat Pratt Homestead on Route 281 at Cold Brook Road. The sign reads, used before the Civil War as an underground station where Orrin Kravitz sheltered and aided fugitives on their way to Canada. The Kravitz Farm records tell us that slaves went on to Syracuse to the home of Horace White, who was president of the New York Central Railroad. According to Kraft's son's memoirs, White provided many slaves with tickets to the West and eventual safety in Canada. The Salisbury Pratt home was built in approximately 1820 to 25. During the late 1960s, the barns which were located on the east side of Route 281 burned. There's no evidence of tunnels, so escaping slaves most likely were sheltered in those barns. That's the Kravis house across the street. Okay, I spent a delightful afternoon with this lady. This is the late Dorothy Rofe. She was the Preble Town historian at the time, and she gave me a tour of many locations in Preble, which served the Underground Railroad. In 1804, the first church was organized in Preble. By 1812, there was a need for a new building, so the first Presbyterian church of Preble was built on what is now the Curry Road near Baltimore, just west of Route 11. The church grew from 17 members in 1804 to 210 members in 1841. At that time, 80 members withdrew, reforming, forming the first free church of Preble, and they began meeting at an old store on Route 11 at the junction of the Curry Road. Mrs. Rowe shared a story that there actually were two reasons for the split. The old storeites, as they were called, because they met in the store, were sympathetic to the cause of freeing the slaves, and their meeting place, the old store, became a station of the Underground Railroad. But there was also a scandal involving some of the young people of the church. A Sunday afternoon sleigh ride, complete with stops at several area taverns, and dancing to boot caused the excommunication of some of the young people. Support from their families gave strength to the new storeites and their church. I think we have one more picture of the uh, cemetery, which was across the road. Yeah. Okay, on to the next. We're now up near Baltimore. Do you know where Baltimore is? In Slab City? I had 
Jim Sarvey. Remember Jim Sarvey? Jim taught me all about Slab City. Slab City. In nearby Baltimore, just past Slab City, the site of a sawmill, there are several properties which probably housed fugitives. Okay, at this house, we met Mr. Stuart Strong. Mr. Strong recalls being told tales of the Underground Railroad in this house by his mother. And Mrs. Rofe, after he, we left him, Mrs. Rofe said he regrets that he didn't listen close enough. <laughs> and she added, but one of our old, oldest res uh, residents affirmed this. So I don't know whether they were referring that, you know, re affirming that he didn't listen close enough or affirming that that really was a stop on the Underground Railroad. But at any rate, just up the street, the road, we found another historical marker describing the tannery and other public buildings. According to longtime resident Fanny Van Busker, the tannery owners took slaves in and kept them. At the tavern just across the road, this is the, this, I think the tannery was behind this building, and then the next slide is of the tavern. At the tavern, it is likely that slaves were hidden in the attic until safe passage could be arranged from a station at the old store. Mrs. Rofe told me that a closed carriage would stop at the door and one of the members of the congregation would take the place of the driver and go to the next station. She continues, it is known that two other homes in Baltimore gave help to the slaves who would arrive in the night and move up the road to the station to be picked up. The station was destroyed by fire several years ago. The other beautiful homes still stand, Mrs. Rope said. Now go across the valley toward Route 281. Nine tenths of a mile north of Route 281 on the Song Lake Road, Mrs. Rope pointed out the former location of another house believed to have been part of the Underground Railroad. One man recalled this home being torn down. A fireplace revealed a small structure behind it, which probably hid two or three small slaves. We passed through Preble Village and south on Route 281 to the base of Mount Toppen. Several references in older papers on the Underground Railroad mention a farm owned by Rufus Hubbard at this location. Known by some as the old Woodmancy Farm, we believe that this is the farm that was described. Mrs. Rofe added, I was told that there are still ladders on homes in Cold Brook which were used to allow slaves into the attics of these places. She added, there were many bounty hunters anxious to capture the slaves. We believe this is one reason why so little was known of the activities. Now earlier in the paper I mentioned Eber Pettit and I'd like to close with just a paragraph from his book 1868. To the longer, younger portion of our readers, the sketches may appear to be somewhat imaginative. It will hardly appear to them to be possible that our own county, and particularly the towns along the lakeshore, have formerly been hunting ground for slaves. Yet such is the humiliating fact. The Underground Railroad track lay through our village and extended along the lake shore to Niagara River and terminated in Canada. Such was the vigilance of the conductors that, we are informed, no one was ever taken back to slavery from this county while under the care of the Underground Railroad Company. The conductors of this road were some of the most noble and self-sacrificing men in the world. Instead of collecting fare of their passengers, they always paid it themselves. Without the fear of the face of clay before their eyes, they boldly pursued their calling, regardless of the fugitive slave law. The mandates of civil authority did not dismay them or make them violate their consciences by the betrayal of the fugitive. They boldly proclaimed by deeds of heroism and self-sacrifice their faith in the higher law. But this celebrated company is now broken up and its business will never be resuscitated. President Lincoln, by proclamation, took away all the transportation and rendered the stock worthless. General Grant and the boys in blue tore up the track and destroyed the structure so that it will never be used again. Its existence and accomplishments have passed away and but a small portion of its history will be perpetrated. 
what would appear singular with most companies, the stockholders do not mourn their loss. That's it.